Hi everyone, welcome to another practicing session again in the framework of the Beethoven project. That's the project that will start at the end of this year, me recording basically all solo works by Beethoven on 22 CDs. So if you would like to attend these practicing sessions live or when they are premiered like this one, that there is no better way than to subscribe to the channel, but not only that, hit that bell icon next to the subscription button and set your notification system because uh, YouTube is not sending out notifications, even not, not anymore, even for the live streams, which they did until a year ago. So set those net notifications and join us here at Monday, 7.30 p.m. Brussels time or in, um, on Thursdays at the Clavichord, 7.30 p.m. as well. The Thursday session sessions are always pre-recorded, so released with this new feature of YouTube as a premiere, so enabling the chat next to the video. If I have time, I will be there also hanging out with you. And on Monday, if possible, we have a live stream at one of the Pianofortes. The reason this has been recorded, it's now Monday, it's 8.58 a.m., so it's rather early. I haven't been playing today, but the reason that I'm recording this instead of doing live is that Jodis Spotflieger, the builder of this Fritz Pianoforte, which is over here, you can't see it, um, is coming to work on the piano. So we are building that piano. That's it. The piano is basically finished, but there are so many details that can be taken in so many directions that we want to take and certainly he but also it's a fascinating project for me though I would love to share that piano with you but it's not still possible he has to give his green light for that and can understand that I think we all can understand that just think, uh, talking about it, uh, thinking about the damping system he's coming to work on there are so many options and time will come that I will make some videos on those aspects as good or bad as I can, because all those terms in English are a little bit difficult sometimes to really discuss in detail. But there will be a fascinating piano and it will be fascinating also and totally unexpected even because this Frenzel piano, the reason that it's here is that it's being given to me by Lorenz, uh, it's Lorenz Guardian's pianoforte, but it's a later type. They are related, but you could say this is more the type of piano that Beethoven had at the end of his life. The Fritz is really close to an 1800 Walter even. So that's fascinating. But that's the reason why we are not live today. Okay, having said that, we are going to practice together the Opus 2 number 3, which is the third piano sonata, the last movement, which I'm playing from this Czerny Simrock edition. If you have never seen that, I can show you here. So I have several of those and I want to play the whole Beethoven project from these editions, but they are really hard to get, which is, and that's a statement I've been making over and over again, I cannot repeat it enough. That's weird. That's so hard to find because this is maybe the most Perfect example what we perhaps should be calling a new Urtext edition. There are some mistakes in this, I mean, typos, so to say, but the, what Czerny did in this last edition he made is add, adding fingerings, adding some, very carefully, some articulation marks. And so it was his third, fourth complete edition. So he was really aware of what an edition should be having or not. And so there are tons of small details that you can find in this edition, not only talking about the fingering. We'll make some videos on that. It's not for this practicing session. So what I'm going to start with, since it's also so early and I haven't been playing the piano today and it was a really busy week, I will start just uh, going over in slow these passages, the 16th notes, because Czerny uses different fingering than I was using. So there we go. Oh, by the way, before we start, just sharing this with you. These are his, can you see that? Maybe I focus here again. His daily exercises. So it's a beautiful edition. And you see, so Czerny wrote this I don't know which year, 1835, 1840 something. 
And so I'm actually starting to play from this. It's fascinating. <laughs> This is the Opus 299 on steroids. If you think that the Opus 299 is extreme, it was actually aimed at beginners. This is a little bit more moderate. So interesting part also in our tempo journey because this, here you find pieces that go into literally 18.6 notes a second and you have repetitions that even on the Steinway wouldn't be possible, technically would not be possible. So that's interesting. Having said that, Anya is just returning from bringing Evelyn to school, so you will hear her coming. Oh, she's leaving the puppy out. So he's 13 weeks now and is getting his own character. And <laughs> it's quite challenging, but he's a, he a good boy. Okay, Joe, let's start with looking at those fingerings because I noticed something. Uh, you have this passage here. And so on. So Cherny gives five on the A, four, three, two, one. It's a little bit out of tune. But then he goes to four. And then three. What I did, and it, might, it may sound as a detail, but still, let's think about it for a, for, for, for a moment. I, I think these small details are fascinating because they can lead to a more broad perspective on the piece over the performance. It's like... It's, the, the core idea of the core essence of what someone is thinking of his performance or his interpretation like here in this case journey fingerings are actually an exterior sign of that it's maybe not expressed in the, in the right way so fingerings are a kind of expression kind of visually visual visualization of this inner idea so if journey uses fourth finger here Instead of three, why why didn't he choose three? So three is easier. He would land on the second finger. Like he does here. So yeah, that's an interesting question. And maybe maybe it's not an interesting question. Because first finger on the D, then you go to four. There is always a risk to accentuate that C, which we don't want, of course. We don't want to have that. It's, it's one bow. I could even imagine five, four, three, two, one, two, and then just jump to the tree. It's such a pity that we cannot call these people anymore. Hey, Carl. Mr. Cherny, what do you think of five, four, three, two, one, second finger, three? Yeah. He he is he is following a kind of normal scale pattern. So he makes no exception here. You could say, well, you make an exception for the four. I'm sorry that we're standing still with this fourth finger so long, but, but th these are the kinds of things that I really think about sometimes for a long time because it sharpens your mind not only for the way you are going to play this piece, but it sharpens your mind as well for um, thinking about how they considered, in this case, the fingering system. So it's, it's, it's important that you realize what their system was, which is, which is hard to, to, to also for the, in these exercises, going through some chromatic exercises. Yesterday I was, I was thinking, well, am I going to follow Czerny's fingering for chromatism, chroma, chromatic uh, scales, or am I going to follow my own fingering, which is different, you have different systems, you know, and those are important decisions because they influence your own way of playing. I think I made the decision to follow his fingering, so basically changing mine, because the reason that I play those, those etudes is not only for just having something to play in the morning without going directly to Beethoven, but also to, um, you know, kind of insert myself in this tradition. And so what Czerny writes here as a fingering, it's maybe not Beethoven's, we can check, but it's very close. It's a, it's closer than mine, so that's the reason why it's important. 
maybe not for all of us, but I enjoy these kind of thought processes. What's, what's very convenient here, so the fourth finger is really not convenient, but then you continue. It's of course okay. I can five, four, three, two, one, and then two, and then jump to the third finger. I can imagine they didn't do that. Because you lose a little bit of control. You have to reposition your hand. And I don't think in that time they like to do that. As in the 18th century, there wouldn't be a problem. Though, you will not find fingerings like that. I, I think I'm going to change that. I'm not going to change that in this score because that's an original one. Remember that. So go to three and then having second thing. Third finger, fine, third. Five, four, three, two, one, two, that's okay, of course. I'm not judging Chinese fingerings by all means. I'm just thinking about it. Then third finger here on the C. I was wondering why not fourth. But what I didn't like apparently is have these finger substitutions. We, we talk about that a lot. And it's still a mystery for me because if I watch my own videos playing, you can see, you can see that I automatically sometimes change fingers on, on the note without hitting it again. So we call that substitutions in Dutch. So substitutions, I hope that's correct in English. Um, so I can see myself doing it more actually and certainly in those octave passages. But I don't think they did that. They did that. I don't think so. And here's the third finger, obviously, with the aim to make this legato, but the right hand is just... and then no pedal. So... So did they... So if you want to just... Let, let's hold hold here for... pause here for a moment. So if you... If you want to have this line... It's nice when it's legato because that enhances the cantabile effect. So yeah, so there you have first finger now, first finger, and then there is no escape from second finger to the F sharp, I guess, and then the fourth finger is going to the C. So you basically you have this. So releasing the A, only being able to play legato, the, the middle voice, and then here I can play legato from the G to the F sharp, but I have to release from B to C. So you can say, well, just add a little bit of pedal that we would do that in conservatory. So with the stretch time, we would do that probably. Although here it's difficult with... You want to have these notes clear. So yeah, these are minor details, but the other the other option is that I just, yeah, here is not so much to do. So you release very softly. Or you suggest a kind of legato. Let's try that. So you have a chum, chum, chum. It's not really legato. This is, of course, th those details, they are important. It's what... Here it's okay. So here you can release this G very soft. difficult so what I'm doing now is actually suggesting the legato in one voice releasing the other voice so I consider this as to be two voices the other voice release them very gentle so I'm yeah you get this John Jim and actually it sounds nice So here, 
you're fingering off gently. Four, five, four, three, five, two. Not the first finger on the F sharp. So second finger, very classic. Remember CPE Bach, you avoid as many times as possible to have the first finger and the fifth finger on the black keys. Jenny follows that rule, not always, because in that time it's not possible anymore. But here, this is a tempo indicator. I can show you in detail perhaps, because we're not live, I can actually, uh, let me just refocus here. So this bar. So four, five, four, four, five, four, three, five, two. Certainly the F sharp will bother you if you play this way faster. Because you will do that with the first finger. I, we should check actually modern uh, recordings, how they, what kind of fingering they, they make. There's no way if you play this double as fast, that you still have time to reposition your hand here from three to five and then go with the second finger to the F sharp. I don't have the Schenker edition. I might have it here, so uh, this is not a volume two. Lying on the Fritz actually. I don't know where it is. My, because Schenker would be interesting to check. We might do that later. But anyway, that's an important uh, thing. That's small. But it's important, every, every detail is important, you know. We will not get more information from Czerny than this. He will never come back and say, oh, let me make this additional comment to what I've uh, uh, written over there. He will never do that anymore. So this is all we've got. So every, every number that he has written somewhere <laughs> is uh, rather important because it's unique. And you can say, well, now you are pushing things to the extremes, and of course I am, in a way. But it's just a kind of mentality that I um, try to uphold, you know. You can overlook so many things, but if you consider, if you just think about it for yourself, if you treat, treat those sources as um, scarce material how that's correct so there, there, there will be not there will be nothing added to that so everything you have that's what you've got there is nothing more then suddenly you see every detail every fingering every bow you see it increases the value of that and then you start seeing fingerings like that that perhaps otherwise we should we, we just overplay you think about okay four five four three five two okay but that's difficult if i want Even five four. So with, 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 with these fingers, that's a tempo indicator. It is. I'm not saying that it's not possible. Double as fast with this fingering. I mean, then we go that that direction. That's actually a direction you don't want to go in because then that's that's just um, you know, it's just meaningless. This is not the most convenient fingering if you want, if you consider this piece to be played double as fast as we are doing it now. That's, that's, and that's a conclusion you can make for yourself. are both on the 16th notes here and then there is one a new one here so end of the bow means basically articulation gap and then a little accent I'm just showing you of course we're not going to play that like that but where the bow ends new 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 And then no bows anymore. Bow. Over the, the whole bar and then... And then forte piano. Yeah. 
So a bow means quite literally in that time, certainly, I think, certainly in this edition by Cerny Legato. Articulation gap. But not too much, I think. And then I would say, why not continue that system? It's nice because it's the G. Gets a little bit of accent, unwanted even, because you make it short. Little, have a little bit more accent. So we check the tempo, it might be a little bit too fast now, I don't know. Let's just check it. Yeah, it's okay. So these accents, we tend to do that not so much anymore. We like to, to treat that music as we have learned to play scales, which is as flat as possible. So if you are in conservatory, you know this, you don't let your fingering influence the, the evenness of the notes you play. And that's actually an important uh, thing to, 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 to be able to do. But it, flattens, it flattened out also this practice, the accents that in that time, I think were much stronger than we do. And it works nice. This is actually not so bad. But then we have two bow over the whole bar. But something else that I know, I've, know, I've noticed here, the left hand. Jump, jump. It's difficult because now the left hand, if I want to have this, give the second note, so jump, jump, make it a little bit lighter. And it goes a little bit against the right hand. You have the ya da 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 ya pa 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 pa. So the D is a little bit too soft, actually. You see, it drops there. You can ask Yoris to do something about it. So, but anyway, so the the, the right hand has this ya da 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 ya da 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 ya da da da. The left hand is ya ram ram pam, and it builds so nice to this ya da 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 da. And then he goes with this. Then he has only one accent per bar. That's interesting. Ya da 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 ya da da da. Well, I don't know. This is the legato bow there. So the bows in the last two bars here, there the bow goes in in, in in a complete bar instead of in six notes here. So that's that's something different. That something different happens there. So let's try that. I first check my camera. Okay, we're back. And so Anya is going to her desk upstairs. So you come, you might hear her. And our puppy dog was just not happy being alone in the kitchen. But anyway, so this is actually interesting. I, I find it fascinating.
we might have to bring this a little bit together in one balance and one tempo regardless of what tempo you choose i mean i want to stick to 116 right now and again it's not because of lack of inspiration i keep reading this and people who just land on the channel say oh yeah you must find this out for yourself because you have to develop a kind of inspiration and kind of it has nothing to do with this i'm just inserting in my interpretation this tempi by czerny which is sometimes hard because it's not your own regardless of double beat or whole beat or single beat um, but for me that's the most certain way to come as close as possible to the thought process of those people because tempo indicates everything you know that's just one of the slogans for this channel changing tempo changes everything and that's basically true for for every type of music so that's the reason why i check this tempo and oftentimes after a while you see that it works really well these people were exceptional musicians so they have they had something in mind that is for us still valid It's so 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 nice to go up in this way. Are we going to accent away the first notes or not? Or so basically what I think about this is normally you accent away the first and the fourth note here in the six eight uh, of course it's music it's beethoven it's not just a kind of lesson here so there is a kind of freedom i think but here i think it works okay when having an accent so not easy because if you miss one of those eighth notes the right length of the accents the whole line is broken it's way easier to play this fast it's way easier because that's just going up in a kind of rhythmical pattern but the individual notes of course the, the the better you can play that those the more the more beautiful it is but it will not ruin your line if you miss the length of just one note with a fraction here it does nothing easier than playing fast so here I have to the last note Also, the rest are important to just keep so not not play shorter so um, not make them shorter I, I, I was looking at some videos about Benjamin Zander because he is making some claims that I sometimes wonder how he can still look in the mirror at night so basically say base Beethoven wrote metronome marks so yeah that's pretty obvious he isolates Beethoven completely from the rest of the time, so making his case. That's how I um, understand his talks about this, also about the Ninth Symphony, as if Beethoven was somewhere in his own bubble, not content, so to say, with all the tempi that other people were taking. But that was a general thing, and so. And I was looking to a cello lesson that he gave. He's a very enthusiastic teacher, I think. 
but of course in one of those cello sonatas you have those you have an adagio with long rests and he say you you make him too short you are afraid of the of, of the rest so just count them out and they started to count and then he of course was counting like one two three four five okay if you do it like that people start to laugh his solution obviously was to double the tempo of the adagio making it into a kind of silly allegretto really really and and the thing i don't understand is if you drive home then from, from that lesson you must think about all those metronome numbers that you know are not possible in this way but still you don't talk about this isolate some cases of beethoven and then pretend as if this is true for the for everything knowing that nobody will ask you the question but here's the same thing don't be afraid of silence the most important thing if you have long pauses like in the pathetic you will see that is the last note you play that must make the suggestion there that the energy must come for the whole bar for the, of the for the whole period of rests if you do that correct you can basically drive upon that last energy for a long while and you're giving the audience the time to listen this is great that beethoven does this here because it gives time to reflect <laughs> but in a way you i think it's necessary it's nice at least to hold this note longer it's not easy but it's necessary then you start to see this poly polyphony because these lines da -dee -da -dee -da -dee, have also a rhythmical function so you have to combine in one line Accents on the first beat are very important. To give these accents, I just move my wrist a little bit deeper, give a little bit more weight into the keys, but not too much. It's only wrist control, control so the fingers. So, 
right? By doing this, you get little accents. And so by, by the degree of the movement of this wrist, you decide how much accent you give. But So forte is not fortissimo in Beethoven's work. I think certainly in this passage you will hear a lot of contemporary. So today's performance really um, let the Steinway or even the pianoforte, just, I mean, play fortissimo. Forte is not fortissimo in Beethoven. Certainly, and so, and even for the whole spectrum of sound, as Czerny writes somewhere, the pianoforte is not designed for making you blow away in sound. It's a very refined instrument that you should always care, um, uh, always take care of in a way that it sounds nice. So the the outbursts of sound, he says, that's preserved for the orchestra. And so you have to remember that because that's not only for the pianoforte important, but it's also important. I think it's again one of those directions that on the piano, these outbursts of energy here we have a voice of someone who's saying, well, mm, maybe not. And so here also, forte is strong, I think, but not giving you, it's a, it's a distinction from fortissimo. And it sounds maybe as a kind of scholar-like boring statement, but think about it. It should refrain you from giving everything in the, the instrument. <laughs> Fortissimo. Piano. And forte. I was just thinking about am I going to follow Jenny's fingering here or not because I've practiced that before with my fingering so for instance I started with three two four one that's the clavichord fingering so F sharp D sharp four one on the E so Jenny writes four two five three so going down up down up I follow here five three four one four two three one three two Jenny writes four two three one four two three one four two which is basically also not so difficult to remember so left hand I guess he just used he, he writes four two three one and then nothing anymore so two one and then perhaps he just continues with two one it's possible Here I do again three two four one. He does four two five three. And then one three and the left hand four two one three four two one three. I I'm doing very 18th century like so four two four two four two four two four two. So here we see something interesting, I think, and that I've made once a video on that. Is my fingering too conservative for Czerny? And sometimes I think it is. Of course, certainly if you go to Bach works, there his fingering is clearly aimed at the at the 19th century piano, early 19th century piano, and they wanted to play these Bach views super legato, of which we don't know what the practice in the 18th century really was. But I think still with a little bit of articulation then. But my fingering is, of course, based heavily upon the organ, which I was trained in Amsterdam by Jacques van Oetmes, who was really hard on fingerings and, and, and trying to 
um, come up with systems for Bach, for later music, for Mendelssohn, for Brown. We had, to, we had all kinds of things, so there was an evolution in that. Uh, he was really hard on that. So my, my fingering is trained based upon his lessons and then on the clavichord, of course, because the clavichord really forces you to apply a fingering system that well, maybe it's not really 100% 18th century, but it's, it will, you will come close because there is no escape from doing that. So, and here Jenny writes something else. This is a new time. So here I have to make the decision, am I going to re-practice that with this fingering or am I going to practice both? Here, two, one. I would never do that. B flat, G. Well, let's think about that because it's important passage. You know, these passages, you, there is something else here. People in those days, I'm convinced, and I will some, make some videos on that, but I haven't got the time to reactivate. I did some, I, people call that, I did some research, but I didn't do research. I mean, not on an academic level, but I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been reading about this a lot. And I, I mean, not in, 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 in new publications, but in contemporary publications um, and once you know that you start to see it everywhere that people apparently didn't look on their hands when playing even Chopin not can you imagine playing not nocturnus by Chopin or even his, his etudes and regardless of what tempo today people are looking all the time like this that's convenient um, because you can look on the position of your hand if you have to jump and things like that. It's technically more secure. And since pianists are trained to memorize everything, that's um, something that falls in line with that. But I think until 1850, 1860, it's the same period as where the increase in the search and virtuosity happened. That until th those days, that time, People didn't look on their hands and were very hard on that for not doing that. E.C.P.E. Bach is even writing on, on that in, in a reversed way. I, it's like I say, if you want to see it, you see it everywhere. C.P.E. Bach says somewhere um, you have to memorize some pieces to practice them in the complete darkness as to avoid you looking on your keys when you're playing. And to go way further, in the last years of Chopin's life, he was in Scotland. So he had a student there, basically, uh, if I remember well, what's the name of that lady? There were two sisters, uh, kind of wealthy persons, and she was, uh, she liked Chopin a lot, I would say, but Chopin didn't fall for her. But he, she invited him to, to England and Scotland, where and still the piano where he played is signed by him. But he writes in a letter that he saw some uh, girls playing, and he writes to someone, and they messed up all the bass notes, even though they watched their hands. So if you know this, again, you, you would overlook such a sentence if you don't know, if you don't take this perspective, but if you say, well, what happens when I, what, what is the meaning of this sentence when I apply the idea that people didn't look on their hands, then suddenly it becomes clear that also Chopin thought you of you as an amateur when you did. But the consequences, of course, gigantic playing this without looking on your hand, it's, it's, you have to start feeling the keys. I am, to be honest, I was practicing this in the year 2000, 2004, when I played the Irar a lot of th times, but it's, I never succeeded in doing that completely. Someone who has a visual problem or is blind as an organist of pianist, it would be interesting maybe to, to exchange some, uh, some ideas and thoughts because they can do it. I mean, if you are visually limited or just blind, then you learn to do it. Helmut Welcher played everything without seeing and he, he became only blind when he was 19 years old. So imagine that. So it's possible. Okay, just sharing this as an interesting story on this passage because that influences also my... Because if, you, if I could play this without looking on my hand, well, 
basic you have time to adjust and to read fingerings then. You see, yeah. So basically what that's, that means is that I take my heritage of my student life and my, my I mean my, my growing up as a musician with me in this project and there is no way that I can 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 get fully rid of that I did play Rachmaninoff I played Skriabin you know it's in my fingers so I cannot pretend as if I didn't play those works I cannot pretend not to have practiced Hano exercises for years uh, I have done that so Basically, what we in, would be interesting, but it's, it's of course out of the question that if you could train a new generation fully in this practice, then see what happens. That would be interesting. But yeah, I mean, you're not going to train uh, children in a way not to play later music and not to play and um, develop their technique. It's talking too much. These upper tones are so difficult on this Viennese piano because they fall really deep and they're very shallow. Yes, it's very easy to fall from. for Beto. But then again here, octaves. How are you going to play that? So with there's no way you can play this really legato. You can suggest a legato, but you have this light. Of course that's done to Jack with a lot of paddling, I guess. But here's no pedaling. What I'm doing now is just substituting here the left hand. So changing fingering here to play it legato. Let's not do that. Let's try. Let's try to release very softly. Not possible. Here, suddenly in the bass, you hear that. So yeah, you could say, well, you're thinking here on basic stuff while going, while heading to recording session. That's true. There is, there are two things here. There's no problem to solve this. I mean, solve. But this kind of legato pedal is something that, if you if you stick to Czerny, Czerny indicates that you can use the pedal also to make some chords legato. Because if you have four note chords, there's no way you can play this legato. So there, yeah. Even if it's not indicated, but here, I must say I'm puzzled here what I'm going to do. So it's not that there is not a decision. It's just that I don't know what decision to take. And I want to be as sober, so to say, not to drink too much pedaling. 
because that's the easy solution. That's actually the same solution as going faster. If you don't figure out how the music works, just go faster. And then there is a kind of short run feel good that happens then. You will come back to the same questions because the music will not change for the, for the worse, I would say. So pedaling the same thing. Sometimes it's beautiful, oftentimes it's beautiful. But if it, is it in the style of that time? If I play it a little bit more forte, it might be my work. I'm going to take care of the camera first. Okay, there I'm again. So wrapping this up, this session. Yeah, we have to come back to this movement. This is really, 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 really difficult. I mean, in details, there's so many de de decisions to be made. And it's so interesting at the same time. So let's just try this now. It's dolce here, dolce, 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 dolce. Yeah. With a long bass note. You can think about having the pedal, but otherwise, the Jenny writes fingering four of it. It's, he wants to have a kind of finger legato. But here, let's stick to this passage. Let's play it a little bit, a little bit louder. Three, two, one, three, two, one, okay. Let's bring the melody really out. <laughs> not using any form of substitution now I'm just using the my wrist to release as late as I can it's a little bit too loud if you come from allowed quote unquote to use the legato pedal here I actually doubt but I don't know for sure what I'm doing now is making finger substitutions all the time but Jenny writes five four one five four two clearly suggesting this five 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 movement he does write some substitutions because you could say well they didn't indicate those yeah they did and it's a study on its own I should get keep track of all that I should keep start noting down all these things you might hear my mother she came into the house but we're going to wrap up the, the session here this is really interesting I, we're going to start next session with this and decide what we are going to do so here five four one Actually, but that's a silly argument and I would never use that. The slower you play, the more you can. On these Viennese pianos, they have a relatively short tone if you compare that to a Steinway. The Fritz is remarkably long, by the way. Yours is always making the attempts to make the instrument sound longer, which is a quality as an instrument builder. It doesn't make your life as a... As an, it's, yeah, it gives you a lot of possibilities, but sometimes having a short tone on its own is not a problem. So here... If you play it really slow, the tone is away, so you make only the suggestion of the legato. But that's the silly argument. That's not so bad, actually. that for now
can be in the waiting room now. You know something is going to happen. difficult now with the black keys. I mean to play legato. I think this is an interesting exercise and an interesting experiment as well. So let's continue with this next time because, and that's, you know, guys, this is great thing about these practicing sessions because um, knowing you're there, I mean, in this case, not live, but also forces me may perhaps to, 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 to look for the solution that makes the more sense within the framework that we put ourselves into. I don't, maybe it doesn't make any sense what I'm saying now, but it's just, you, there is a, I, I feel that, that with you together, I go a little further than I perhaps would have gone otherwise. I mean, again, there are a, solutions for this. Use a little bit of pedal, but now it's interesting. I see things now, I feel things now here, and it's not primarily tempo related, but in a certain tempo, this will work without pedal and just by suggesting the legato without finger substitution. So let's stick to that as long as we can. At the end, of course, it must sound correct, correct in a way it must, must be conv convincing, but that's, we're not there yet. The recording must sound convincing, but the path through to that recording, we, we uh, are not going any difficulties out of the way to solve within the frame, or within the historical context that we, as we speak, have put for ourselves. And that will change that context. It would be stupid not to consider that as a flexible thing, not to make excuses or things of that nature, but just to evolve and to develop. Because again, this time is, is, has long gone. We are reconstructing something that we sometimes, because of the music is so close to us, sometimes have the impression it's still so close to us, but it's actually very far away. Okay, hope you like this session. And uh, next time on Thursday, we are the clavichord. The clavichord is not even there. If I point to the clavichord, but it's an empty space. I had a concert on Friday and it's still packed on the table over there. I can look at it. So I have to tune, I think, but that's a good thing because the clavichord was rather out of tune last sessions. So that will be with the Rihini variations. Yes, practicing those. And it will be good that we have a clavichord session because um, it's, these practicing sessions really keep me playing now the, uh, on the clavichord, uh, which is necessary. I need that also to keep my touch on the same level for the pianoforte. This is all related to each other. So great to have these sessions. I know it's for a relatively small part of our authentic sound community, but that part which is you, if you're still watching now, is actually the core reason that I put all this energy here. Um, it's the essence actually of the channel. Everything comes together, presenting sometimes a quote or a source as a final um, uh, proof, so to say, as, as our latest video last week, uh, the end of tempo discussion is a little bit of oh, the title is a little bit of clickbait. Perhaps I am serious about it. I'm going to update. I mean, make a new video on that because some people reacted on that with arguments that I can understand, but I think needs to be addressed to give you an even more clear picture on this Donnell source. But in those videos, of course, I present things from the position of. Um, well, that's a stone, that's a brick, or even a little piece of the puzzle in this great image of the big image that we're trying to reconstruct was with so many parts missing. And then if you have such a source, you think about it and you see, does it fit in this puzzle or this image or in that image? And that's the reason why that's just the, the, the nature of those videos. But here in these sessions, we come actually to the essential work that needs to be done with that. And it's a lot of questions come, uh, come into mind and, and 
sharing that with, with you makes me a little bit vulnerable sometimes, perhaps. And if people want to make uh, use of that, they are my guests because I don't care too much. Uh, we have all our own responsibility, you know, for the things we are doing, you are doing, and inspiring each other a little bit or helping each other or just sharing things that we care deeply about in the hope that it makes a little bit of a difference in somebody else's life. That's actually the nature of human beings connecting to each other. And for that reason, these social platforms are really fabulous. So let's end with this positive message and looking forward to the next session here. And sometimes, you know, then really ending this video with, uh, with this practicing session with that, I will now move from the piano and I've I actually want to record another session again because there are so many ideas I want to work out. And in this case, you could say, well, just practice along and I will do that. But it's so fun to share that with you, this, 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 this journey uh, that, well, when we have the studio, we, maybe we have daily practicing sessions, who knows? Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for being here. Also for my Patreons, I want to, want to thank them especially because uh, they make these things possible. I'm spending time here also making this video and recording, uh, having all this equipment now standing on a thick cloth. Don't worry, on the, on the fridge, so it won't be... Uh, get any scratch from that but the reason that i can do that is thanks to my, thank you thank to my patrons and if you are liking these sessions and really want me to keep going just one dollar a month it's a possibility there can make a difference because if the number is big enough okay this can be even a part-time or who knows in the future a full-time job and then I would be able to even share a lot more things with you so thank you for my patrons but thank you overall for being here and we see each other soon again.